Hello, welcome to Free Bible Commentary with Pastor Teacher Dr. Bob Utley. Be sure to visit Free Bible Commentary at www.freebiblecommentary.org. Now, here's Bob. Well, we're going to be starting a brand new book tonight. And I think it's one of the most exciting books in the New Testament. It is very seldom done because people get so tired going through 1 Corinthians, they poop out before they ever get to second. But I, when I look through, I have a preaching Bible and a study Bible. When I went through my preaching Bible, I was amazed at the number of sermons that I have in 2 Corinthians. It is just a stupendous book. And oh, what a problem Corinth was. Corinth was a church that Paul loved. But there was a minority in the church of Corinth that vilified him, attacked him, criticized. Oh, he just had a time with this church. I'd like you to look at the introduction. I think it's written probably six to twelve months after 1 Corinthians. Paul has been in Ephesus where there's a great revival going on. But he is so worried about the church in Corinth, he had sent Titus to see about the church. Titus had not come back and not come back and Paul couldn't stand it anymore and he went by boat to Macedonia and met Titus in Macedonia and Titus said, the problem's been solved. And Paul just melted in love, wrote this letter and sent it from Macedonia. Now I want you to look at the introduction you have in your outline number three and I want to show you the kind of things that this minority was criticizing Paul for. Because in the introduction, it's very important. We'll see it in just a moment. First of all, they accused him of being fickle. When we get to about verse 15, they said, Well, you told us you were going to do this, and now you've changed your travel plans, and that's just exemplary of how you change your gospel, too. Well, see, they were using his travel plans as a way to attack his gospel. And that was a very treacherous thing. Number two, they told him he was weak, wasn't a strong individual. Look at chapter 10, verse 10. They said he was not a good preacher. That cut to the quick. 10, 10, 11, 6. They said, Paul preached just for money. 11, 7 and following, 12, 13 and following. They said, Paul was not a true Jew. You need to write it in your outline. 11, 5, 13, 12, 4. Number 6. Paul, Paul, hmm. Number 6 is not a true Jew. So number 5 must be something else. You can look up those scriptures and find out for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Number seven, they said, we have a direct revelation from God. And so in chapter 12, Paul says, I've had a direct relation myself. And so here, the, here was the areas of criticism. Now, they also attacked his apostleship. And you can see that in chapter 1, verse 1, where Paul is going to deal with this whole idea that he was not a true apostle because he did not walk with Jesus in the flesh. Now, he's going to really have to defend his apostleship. Here, Galatians 1.1, 1, 1, in many other books, the first thing he said, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, not by the will of man, but by the will of God. What he's saying is, friends, I have authority from the Lord Jesus. And, but we're going to see how he balanced that with love for the church over here in verse 23. Not lording it over you, and on and on. So, I want to mention quickly an outline, if I could. It seems that first, Second Corinthians is broken into three separate units. Chapters 1 through 7 deal with the report from Titus about the church. Chapters 8 and 9 deal with the contribution for the saints in Jerusalem. And chapters 10 through 13 deal with the attack of the minority, especially the Judaizers, on Paul and his gospel. So those are the three areas, okay? Now, you, why do you think Paul's name was changed from Saul to Paul? I, think Paul? I think Paul always had two names, a Hebrew name and a Greek name. And when he was working with Jewish churches, it was obvious to use the Hebrew name. But when he started working with Gentile churches, he tried to transliterate Saul into Greek. But guess what Saul put into Greek means? It's got two possible backgrounds. Waddling or effeminate. He chose to be called Paul, from then on. <laughs> now, the Greek word Paul means little. And we, there have been a lot, of, a lot of fight about what that means. Uh, the a second century non-canonical book called Paul and Thelka, which is supposedly Paul at Thessalonica and his love affair with a, a lady there. <laughs> Racy book, second century. 
uh, it describes Paul. Now, we don't know if it's true or not, but it's from the same area where he was, and maybe the, maybe the physical description is true. Short, fat, bald, bushy eyebrows, protruding eyes, bow legs. He didn't look too hot. <laughs> and so maybe that's what it means, little, his statue. But most think that it's referring to his sense of his being the least of the saints. Why? Because he persecuted the church. Ephesians 3, 8, he describes that. 1 Timothy 1, 15, he describes that. I think it's the latter. Because he persecuted the church and the grace of God, he says, I'm the least of the least. And I think he felt that way. Now here it says, by the will of God, an apostle. He wasn't a normal apostle. He didn't walk with Jesus. We don't know if he met Jesus in the flesh or not. We don't know if he saw the crucifixion. He may have. We just don't know. But Jesus did appear to him, and three times in the book of Acts, he records his personal testimony, how on the road to Damascus, a bright light shone, and God, the, uh, Jesus spoke to him, and on and on. So he, he asserts, I'm a little unusual. He calls himself one born out of due time, but that he is an apostle by the will of God. The word apostle means sent one. It's used so often in John where Jesus says, the Father has sent me, so send I you. Same word, apostello. Now, notice he says, and Timothy our brother. Now, in 1 Corinthians 1.1, 1, 1, it, meant, it mentions Sosthenes. We don't hear about Sosthenes in this book. We hear about Timothy. He was a co-worker, a helper, a fellow minister. And, and he, he's mentioned here. Notice it says, to the church. Now, this is the word ekklesio. Ek, out of, kaleo, to call. It is the word used by the Greek translators of the Old Testament to translate the Hebrew phrase, the congregation of Israel. We would think of the people of God. And so they wanted to choose this name that meant a regular town assembly in Greek to say that they had a unity with the people of God of the Old Testament. It also said they were called out by God, divinely chosen ones is also a good way to do that. The ecclesia of God. That is at Corinth with all of God's people. That's the word saints. I want to say again, there's saint is not our goodness, but Christ's goodness imputed to us. Now, hopefully our position of sanctification in Christ will develop more and more into our personal sanctification. Hopefully, it's moving from position to possession. Hopefully, the infilling of the Holy Spirit, the Word of God, is going to help us be more like Christ. The word saint, the root, is related to the word holy, the word sanctify, the word consecrate, all have the same root. So a saint is a separated one, for a particular task. That's what the word means in Hebrew, to separate, and to separate unto somebody for a particular task. So we are separated ones unto God to fulfill an assigned task. Now, something else I think is interesting here. The word saint never appears in the singular except one time in Ephesians in a corporate context. Friends, there ain't no lone rangers in this deal. To be a Christian is to be in a community of faith. To be a Christian is to be in a community of faith. If we'd just ever stand together, the world would take note of us. It is a unity. It is a fellowship. Now, and it says to God's people all over. Now, you may have Greece in your translation, but the Greek has Achaia. If you look in the back of your map real quickly, the modern peninsula of Greece is broken into two Roman provinces. The southern part called Achaia and the northern part called Macedonia. Now, because it says all the churches in Achaia, it's obvious that Paul's letter, that seems very personal and very specific to this local church in Corinth, was meant to be read by a much larger group of Christians. Very early, Paul's letters were recognized to be what they were, the Word of God. And they began to collect them, and every church would make them a handwritten copy, and it became a precious thing, and they began to be read to all the churches in an area. And obviously, that seems what was referred to here. Then in verse 2, it uses the regular Greek greeting, which is karin. Now, karin means greetings. But Paul slightly changes the normal Greek form into chorus. Corin greetings, be like our dear John or dear Sue, to Corin grace, from greetings to grace. And I think that's a beautiful way to do that. Grace to you and peace. Many think the peace 
is the idea of shalom, the Hebrew greeting, and that these New Testament authors took the great word grace from Greek background and the Hebrew word shalom and brought the church together from its Jewish and Greek roots to say grace and peace. I think that's beautiful there. I'm not sure it's true, but I, I like it. To the God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now remember, when the, where God's called Father, it's not sexual generation. Jesus has always been with the Father. There never was a time when Jesus was not. So it's not sexual generation and it's not chronological order. It is intimate family fellowship, intimate family terms. That's why God's called Father. I've gone through Lord Jesus Christ so many times, I will not do it. It's in your outline. Now, in verse 3 through 11 is a prayer. And it's a prayer of praise to God. The word blessed in verse 3, it, we get the English word eulogy. It's always used of praise for God. Matthew 5, 1 through 11, blessed are, is this idea of eulogy. Well, I take that back. I think I've transposed those words. I think that's a different word in Matthew 5. So scratch that out with you and just put, the preacher made his first mistake. <laughs> now, notice where it says, Blessed be the God, and it lists three things about God that I think are so beautiful. When you finally know what God is like that you serve and follow, boy, it's a blessing to know what He is. What is He? Well, number one, He's the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So in Jesus Christ, we know something about God. But look at number two, the Father of all mercies. And number three, the all-comforting God. Boy, isn't that neat to know that our Father, the God of the universe is the God that sent Jesus Christ to die on our behalf, the God that loved us so much He is willing for His own Son to die, the God who can be characterized as the Father of all mercies and the God of all comfort. I can go to a God like that with my deepest needs and problems and know that He cares. Now notice, if you would, uh, I'd like you to take your pencil and in verses 3 down through 10, would you underline in your Bible how many times the word comforting or comfort is used? And if you'll do that quickly, you will see that it's used ten times. Now, this is a very important Greek word. In the Gospel of John, when John wants to talk about the Holy Spirit, he calls him the Comforter. Now, you may have heard it as Parakletos. It's the word para, which means alongside, and kaleo, just like ecclesia. It means Someone called alongside to give aid and help. It's used of a defense lawyer. Perry Mason would be a parakletos <laughs> that we would be used to. Someone called alongside for help. That's the root of this word here. So throughout this comfort becomes the, the uh, overriding focus of this prayer. Comfort amidst persecution. The God of all mercies against times of, of hardship and problems and pressures. And that's the beauty of this prayer. Now, notice where it says in uh, verse 5, who comforts me in every sorrow I have so that I can comfort people who are in sorrow. I believe in this little prayer, verses 3 through 11, we have two of the purposes of God for Christian suffering. Now, suffering, according to this prayer, is the norm for all Christians. Let me say that again, please. Suffering is the will of God for His children. I'm not sure you're going to buy that. I want to show you in a minute. And I want to tell you why suffering is the will of God. There's a theological basis. The first one is here. When I'm suffered, I can comfort others who've suffered. That's the first reason. The second reason is over here in verse 9 where it says, to keep me from depending on myself instead of God. Suffering shows us we cannot depend on our own resources, our own self, our own strength, our own agenda. Suffering is the will of God. Now, I want to give you a few verses because it continues where it says, verse 5, For just as my suffering for Christ are running over the cup. Sounds like Psalms 23, 5. The cup runneth over. But lo and behold, it doesn't run over in just health, wealth, prosperity, and good cheer. It runs over in suffering. Isn't that, a, isn't that an unusual thing? That God, the God of all comfort, gives His children suffering? Think of the paradox of that. The God of compassion, the God of all comfort, the God who, who fills us with His Holy Spirit and sends His Son is the God who calls us to suffering. 
and fills our cup with the hard things. You say, why is that? I want to give you a series of Scripture references that I would like for you to look up when you have more time and see if you agree with me that God's norm for the Christian is, is persecution. I'd like you to look up Romans 8.17, Galatians 6.17, Philippians, they're in your outline, Philippians 3.10, Colossians 1.24, Hebrews 13.13, 13, 1 Peter 2, 9-23, and supremely, 1 Peter 4, 12 and following. Now, I'm not sure I can convince you that suffering is for the will of God for every Christian. For I want to tell you, God wants us to stand up against the ungodliness of the age in which we live. And the moment we stand up for Jesus in a world like ours, we're going to be put down. The reason we have no suffering in the church is we become a spoiled group of cultural babies. We don't want to rock anybody's boat. We just want to float with the tide and we live in a godless culture and we must stand up in love for the things of God. We must. And when we do, we'll get it right in the teeth. Now, notice if you mentions here, uh, if I am sorrow, it is on behalf of your comfort and salvation. If I am comfort, it is for your comfort that is experienced. Paul's saying... I've hurt for you, and I've hurt for your behalf. And he continues to talk about that. Notice the word in verse 6 that mine has, by your patient endurance. This is that Greek word that means active, voluntary, steadfast endurance. Oh, that we had that today. Active, voluntary, steadfast endurance. Paul said, I'm not fickle. You're not fickle. We're locked in to the will of God. Now, notice what mentioned in verse 8, a little strange little sentence. For I do not want you to be uninformed about the sorrow that I suffered in Asia. Now, what did he suffer in Asia? Look what he says. Because I was so crushed beyond the power to endure that I was in dire despair of life itself. Yes, I felt within my very self the sentence of death. Look down at verse 10. Save me from a death so horrible... What did Paul go through in Asia that was that kind of trauma? We do not know. Some think it's referring to Acts 19, verses 23 through 41, about the riot with Demetrius the silversmith. But that doesn't seem that... It's pretty bad, but it doesn't seem fighting here. Did you know there's even a reference in 1 Corinthians 15, 32 to Paul fighting with wild beasts at Ephesus? Now, a Roman citizen should not have been put into arena with wild beasts. And maybe Paul's using it metaphorically of evil men. We don't know. But Tertullian thought he had to really fight wild animals, literally in the arenas at Ephesus. I'm not sure. My personal belief is that it's related to Paul's thorn in the flesh that will occur in chapter 12, 7 through 9. Now, there's, I can't be dogmatic on this because there's many theories about malaria and on and on, but I think Paul had, an, because eye disease was very common in this time in the ancient world, I think Paul had oriental ophthalma, which is a protruding, painful eye disease that not only causes uh, gr blindness to a large degree, but excruciating headaches. I don't think Paul could be left alone for very long because he could not get around well. And the reason I say that is two verses that I think tell me that's true. In one place where Paul is, he let someone else write most of his letters, but the very last few sentences, he would take the pen and write them in his own hands. And he says to, I forgot what, what book it's in, see with what large letters I am writing you. I think he had to write larger because he couldn't see the little. And then he says to the Philippians, you would have given me your own eyes if possible. Now, that is a strange thing if he didn't have problems with his eyes. So I personally believe Paul's thorn in the flesh with his eyes. Maybe he, in those low-lying regions along the coast he had terrible uh, problems with his disease. I don't know. But those are the three main theories. The Metrius Rebellion, the Fighting at Wild Beast of 1 Corinthians, and the thorn in the flesh. I prefer the thorn in the flesh. But I want you to know this. The apostle of the Gentiles literally thought he was going to die. He thought he was dead and was surprised that God saved him. Now, then he says, uh, verse 10, the word saved, the word saves used three times in verse 10. 
Now, this is the Old Testament definition of saved. This is not spiritual salvation, for Paul is as saved as he can be spiritually. This is the Old Testament definition of salvation, which means physical deliverance. Okay? Notice he says in verse 11, because you are helping me by your prayers. Paul believed the reason he was still alive was the intercessory prayers of the people of God. Do you believe that your prayer can change someone else's life? I do not understand how God can do that. But I know this. God has promised to change things based on the prayers of His people. Promised. Happens over and over. And by the way, He's promised to not do nothing until His people pray. That puts a great responsibility. Have you ever heard it says, We have not because we've asked not? It works both ways. <laughs> now, notice if you would, the next paragraph begins. For my boast is this, that I may... Uh, consciously testify that before the world, but especially before you, I have acted from pure motives. Now, he was being blasted. They heard him say one thing and attacked him. They misread his motives completely. They accused him of every base thing in the world. And Paul said, that's not true. I have acted from a good conscience toward God. That's what he's saying here. Now, that's where he says, and in sincerity before God, not depending on worldly wisdom. Now, Paul uses the word fleshly. It's, literally, it's fleshly wisdom. It's used again down in verse uh, 17, in accordance with worldly notions. Now, Paul, he does it with several words, but this is the worst one. The Greek word for flesh is the word sarx, S-A-R-X. And Paul uses that in three different ways. And you've got to know the context to know how he's... He'll, he'll talk about Jesus in the flesh. Now, obviously, when he says Jesus in the flesh, he doesn't mean Jesus is sinful. He just means the physical body of Jesus. Sometimes he'll use the word flesh as speaking of humanity, almost like John's world is Paul's flesh. Human society organized and functioning in its own craftiness. In our day, it would be called humanism the flesh, worldly notions. And then it's used, especially in like Romans 6, for the fallen nature. We call it the Adamic nature or the sin nature or the fallen part of man. And you've got to know where he is to know how he's using that or it can really cause some major theological problems. He mentions the second coming in verse 14. Uh, he says about boasting on the day of atonement, I, on the day of the Lord. I... Uh, I don't know what the second coming is going to be like, but uh, I believe there's going to be a time where we get to share the, pe to the people who blessed our lives. To lift up that one who won us to Christ. To lift up those Sunday school teachers that nurtured us in the Lord. To say thank you to a godly parent. Paul says, on that day, I get to boast about you. <laughs> you knew Paul would say that, didn't you? Now, notice where he mentions here, it was because of this confidence that I planned to visit you. And now this next few paragraphs, Paul says, I've made a mistake. I planned to come this way and this way and this way, but things have happened and now I don't know what to do. I can't do what I planned on doing, so I'm going to have to change my travel plans. And they said, yeah, that's just an example of how you change everything. You're just a fickle person. You can't make up your mind. Even your gospel has changed. Well, friends, that just made Paul fighting mad. Mess with his travel plans, that's okay. Mess with his gospel, you just rile the boy up. And so he begins in this theological treatise, beginning in about verse 17, about that Jesus is God's yes to man's no. And then look at the word amen in verse 21. Here, let me, let me read a little bit. Verse 20. But with him it is always yes. For as many as the promises of God may be, through him they are always yes. This is why our amen through him is for the glory of God when spoken by us. Well, now, Paul's playing on the word yes and the word amen. Now, the word amen is a Hebrew word, and it is the Hebrew root for the word faith. It's usually pronounced emoth, but it's the root amen. Habakkuk 2.4, the just shall live by amen, emoth, amen. It primarily means to be firm, but it came to mean loyalty to, trustworthiness, uh, faithfulness. 
Now, this faithfulness is primarily what God does for us. God is faithful. Because God is faithful, we can depend on His faithfulness. And that's really what biblical faith is, depending on the trustworthiness of God. Faith is not an act that we do. Faith is a response to God's trustworthiness. And that's the idea of amen here. Now, you notice the Trinity in verse 21? But it is God, through union with Christ, and has given us His Spirit. It is true the word Trinity never appears in the Bible. But passage after passage, the triune God is involved in all three persons in the redemption of mankind. Notice here, it talks about, but God who makes us. Now, there are four participles with God as the object. Now, God's going to do three things, four things for His people. Listen to these. Here's the first one. He is going to make you as secure through union with Christ. And this word secure is a present tense verb, and it is a seller's... Listen to me now. There's going to be three, three uh, commercial words here. It is a seller's guarantee. A seller's guarantee. Now, the second one is, He has anointed us. I believe this is heiress tense, once and for all. He's, he's anointed us or equipped us or called us. Look at number three. He has sealed us. This is the idea of sealing that is a commercial term for ownership, authenticity, genuineness, hasn't been violated. So he has uh, secured us, he has anointed us, he has sealed us, and then finally, he has given us the first installment of future reward. This is the word earnest money. This is the, the, the uh, seller's guarantee that if you start to buy his house and put some money down, and if you renege, he gets the money, right? Isn't that what earnest is? Well, what this is in the, in the New Testament, it's the Greek word for an engagement ring. You girls know that you may not have him completely, but if you've got that engagement ring, it's all over, right? That's the word. And speaking of Christ, it means this. We don't have everything of God right now, but we've got something significant. It's not just pie in the sky by and by. It's walking with him right now. Now, we don't have everything right now, but, oh, we got something, and what we got is absolutely marvelous. <laughs> we have the first installment. Now, look at verse 23. Paul says, Upon my soul I call God to witness. Well, Paul is given an oath. You mean Paul swears? Paul swears all the time. Let me give you a few. Romans 1, 9, Galatians 1, 20, Philippians 1, 8. 1 Thessalonians 2, 5. And Paul wants to say, I'm telling you the truth. I'm not lying. He says, God be my witness. And he does that all the time. He just can't think of anybody bigger to swear by than the God of heaven. I think that's true. Let's see where it says, I gave up my first visit to Corinth. There is a real problem between how many visits. One visit, two visits. This is the third visit, the fourth visit. We don't know. There's a lot of theories in modern scholarship about uh, did, he come, did he write three letters? Did he write two letters? Is Second Corinthians combined one and two? Friends, I don't think I know. I don't think anybody knows. And let's just go with the message and not try to doubt on what maybe could be without any source. Look at Paul. Here's the apostle. Verse 24. Now that we are trying to lord it over your faith, but as co-workers. Now here's the authoritative apostle recognizing the autonomy of a local church. Paul says, I am an apostle by the will of God. What I say is go. And then he'll say, but I don't want to lord over your faith. What you all decide, we'll do. Because he would not roughshod over that church. I think that's a beautiful balance of that too. Co-workers with you to promote your joy, for in your faith you are standing firm. And there's the beautiful conclusion to this first chapter.